ஆச்சாரியஸ் Thank you very much. Thank you very much and uh, I'm deeply honored to be here on this uh, forum and the fact that uh, you'll have such a wide audience and you have uh, such a reputation uh, that I find uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be here talking to everybody. Thank you so much sir. Thank you so much sir. So you may continue sir where you had left last time so that uh, there will be continuity thereafter we'll keep asking questions. So uh, being a fighter pilot for such a long period maybe around four decades uh, which was your the uh, happiest uh, shorty sir oh actually i you know that's that's a very very difficult question <laughs> okay. but um, but frankly speaking um, you know there there have been some uh, crucial times that one remembers and uh, there's one particular one that uh, is not one shorty there were a few of them the the mig 25 had to go through a certain structural strengthening that was required after a certain life period you all have all worked in aeroplanes i think everybody understands that aircraft go through a lot of stress uh, during their uh, life period and after 10 years of life there's a certain um, structural strength testing that has to be done now the mig 25 as uh, last time uh, you all uh, heard and i think everybody is aware the fact that uh, nobody has uh, seen the aeroplane we didn't have any infrastructure or we didn't have a backup a brd or an hal or anybody to support us we just had the russians to support us sir and i think i mentioned last time sometimes we never had fuel we never had tires because they wouldn't accept the indian fuel and the indian tires and they would come from russia and we would be stuck for flying for two months and three months at a time uh that was the initial a uh, lot then after that it got cleared indian oil got cleared and uh, dunlop was cleared to give us tires so we were fine as far as that is concerned but where the airframe was concerned and where the, the design features and the strengthening and what can be done etc was still with the russians and we had no control and we had no clue as to what is to be done although we had a very very fine set of uh, technicians engineer engineering officers the airmen who were trained in russia and then who had done the training here and been there for many years we had some fantastic uh, technicians uh, in the squad highly qualified uh, highly respected and we all held them in very high esteem but the fact of the matter is there are certain things that at a certain level where you go to second line and third line yeah, uh, second line is in the squad but the sec- third line and fourth line then it is beyond the squad technician and this is where you, where you need the expertise of of the manufacturer so in my second tenure as a ceo at that stage uh, the aircraft had reached a level where it needed to undergo a uh, structural strengthening and a recheck of the rigging of the aircraft because the aircraft although there was no high g involved like we we mentioned last time the aircraft was not capable of doing aerobatics and so you didn't have to pull g like normal fighter aeroplane and uh, so it it didn't go through those sort of stresses but it did go through a very high stresses of heat and uh, the speed at which it flew in the in the stratosphere and as i mentioned that the skin temperatures used to be around 300 degrees celsius plus whereas the ambient temperature outside was minus 85 and minus 90 so these changes of temperature the speed at which the aircraft flew the air flow over the over the wing and these under these conditions all that affected the structure or the structural strength of the aircraft so at a certain point in time the russians told us that this has to be done so they came and uh, they set up a full mini 
infrastructure in our in a hangar in bareilly and they started to dismantle the aircraft and doing the testing make, making adjustments to the w- wings and everything else and adding and subtracting various things to get the fuselage and the wings back in the shape that it was supposed to have as a continuation of his life thereafter a frame life had to continue and uh, when this thing started that is and uh, and it was ongoing that is when we realized that there is a bit of a problem because as i think everybody is aware since everybody has been with aeroplanes in in some form or the other that once you dismantle an aircraft and you remove the wings and the tail and the fuselage you break yeah. it up into two you remove the en- rear fuselage for engine change that's fine but when you remove the wings and you readjust various structural things inside the wing then the entire thing once it's fitted back has got the balance and all everything the rigging as you call it if you remember mm-hmm. the word the rigging changes now when rigging changes and the riggings have to be adjusted those aircraft are considered actually fourth line and fourth line servicing that was being done on those airplanes when you remove you know the wings and you readjust various things and fourth line testing of the airplane is only authorized by a test pilot okay it cannot be done by a routine a normal squadron pilot we are not qualified we don't know what will happen supposing the wing falls off or something oh. happens how, how do we check how do we know <laughs> okay how, how do we know what's going to happen and so to study the whole thing and to understand it the mathematics the physics it was beyond our level it, this is only the test pilot level that understands this and i'm sure if there are any test pilots they will not yeah we we thing. did have the call with uh, air marshal rajkumar sir he was also a test pilot yes so thing. it is a test pilot job and now we realize that there is no test pilot who has flown this aeroplane okay <laughs> except air marshal ramchandran who retired as the vice chief uh, now late air marshal ramchandran and uh, he was a person actually who flew it in russia and evaluated the aeroplane and gave the okay for the indian air force to buy the aeroplane who buy the okay. Aeroplane. okay so his experience on the aeroplane was in russia in india no test pilot had flown the aeroplane so now it was a bit of a problem as to what we're going to do so air transport was in a bit of a bind the work had started the structural re-rigging of the aeroplanes was being done and uh, the strengthening was being done and uh, so now it became an issue as to what is how do we go about it. and uh, they finally realized that to put somebody through the whole process would take a little time and it may not be feasible maybe i'm not sure whether the trainer was unserviceable or something and we didn't have any way to allow the test pilot to fly this so finally they decided that commanding of will be granted the permission by air headquarters to do this thing okay so i was summoned by the chief's office actually and the chief called me and he said look we have this problem your aircraft have been tested uh, there is no test pilot to the job and uh, you are at the moment currently flying the aeroplane the most experienced man on the aeroplane he says will you, will you undertake the job i said certainly sir i will undertake the job uh, the only thing is that uh, i mean i don't know what guarantees and warranties a test pilot has because the insurance issues so i said i just want the family to be safe as a pilot one is fearless one doesn't uh, question technical side once they have done their job and you studied it along with them and they've explained it to you and you sat in the cockpit when the rigging is being done so i had full faith in my technical uh, staff the officers and the men sir. who had w- worked shoulder to shoulder with the russians yeah. in doing the job so i said i have full faith in my team so i will take on the job only thing is i the safeguards that the test pilot is given for insurance and for uh, the family whatever it is in case yeah, i said i don't know what it is and i yeah. still don't know i, yeah. I have never asked the test pilot Uh, but uh, i said i need the assurances so that you know the mind is clear that uh, there is tomorrow if something happens on take off in fact we had the, we were setting up this the squadron when i think the the fourth aircraft that was made by the russians the first lot that came in 81 the fourth aircraft after take off at about uh, 100 meters just off the ground the aircraft started to roll like this and went into the ground crashed okay the pilot the russian pilot 
that time the Russians were doing testing and then handing it over to the Indians. The Russian test pilot ejected when the aircraft goes and he realized that it's uncontrollable. And somewhere here, when it was halfway down the roll, before it crashed downwards, he ejected sideways. Okay. And he was safe. He Good was sir. taken to the military hospital. And in the middle of the night, uh, this is again, you know, like we had the CIA and the KGB. Ah. The, sec- the Secret Service guys from the embassy <laughs> came and, and took him away from the military hospital at night. Okay. So that we had no clue as to what had gone <laughs> wrong with the airplane. Okay. Except we found out from the FDR flight data recorder and whatever analysis we could do. But what the pilot felt, we never got to know because he ran away. So secret so, duties. I mean, he, they, whatever they didn't want to tell us at that time. Yeah. Ir- irrespective. So I said, if something like that happens, I don't know. So the chief told me that I give you my word and uh, that we will look after you and the family and uh, you have nothing to worry about. I said, sir, that is enough, that is enough insurance for me. Sir. And I will do the job. So all the all the five or six aeroplanes that were done at that time, which had finished ten years of life, I did all the testing for them. Great, sir. Great. Two, two, three sorties, and so uh, for me, it was an experience of a different kind to check out various parameters. Then on the RT, you keep talking to the uh, to the technicians to tell them what is happening when you do various parameter checks in the in the air. So it's being recorded on the tape recorder in the cockpit, the cockpit voice recorder. And uh, also, your tran- I would transmit it outside so that they would be recording it and one knew exactly what was happening in the airplane. Yeah. Right from the time it took off till before takeoff, from the time it started and from through the takeoff and landing. So we salute so, your courage, sir, great, sir. For, sir, for, sir mm-hmm. undertaking such a, a critical mission. Oh, good job, it was. <laughs> no, it was a part of the job. So this type of uh, repair work or restrengthening work was done after 100 flying hours? I don't remember the airframe hours. Uh, there's a, I think everybody is aware there are certain life. Airframe hours you have, engine hours you have. Yes, sir. The engine hours were 800. The airframe life was also around 1000 hours or something like that. So and after our uh, first and second line servicing, we cover 25 hours and 50 hours inspection. Correct. And after 100 so, hours, uh, aircraft so, used to go to base repair depot. Right. That was so a routine th- those days. I don't know. I, I was long time back. I left my Air Force in 77. So I'm talking something before that. Right. So this was being done at uh, after almost 15 years of, of the aircraft in the squadron. Oh, okay. they, they, they must have been because more, more than they, 200 hours, sir. It must have they, been more than 200 hours. Yes, yes, definitely. I, I, I would say uh, 500. 500 yeah. hours, uh, at least uh, on the airframe. I'm not sure exactly. Great, I don't like it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, one more. Uh, no, you, you have been, I mean, you were uh, awarded with uh, Kirti Chakra also, sir. Chaurya Chakra. Ah, sorry, Ch- Chaurya Chakra for uh, one incident that happened uh, 42 years back, somewhere in uh, 8th May 1980. It's in the citation. So when we right. were a flight lieutenant, so I just read out uh, that passage of uh, award. So on 8th May 1980, Flight Lieutenant Sumit Mukherjee was flying an instructional instrument, flying sortie. At a height of 4,900 meters, he experienced a front bearing failure and short engine seizure took, took place. Till then, no reliable statistics were available on the rate of descent of aircraft experienced with seizure engine and different configuration of aircraft using undercarriage and flaps. With a totally professional approach, Unmindful of great danger to his own life, Flight Lieutenant Mukherjee passed on to the flying control the various rates of descent he experienced with and with and without undercarriage. Despite a very high rate of descent, he, through his uh, fine airmanship, managed to land the aircraft and thereby saved a valuable aircraft from certain destruction. He also helped in collecting valuable data on the situations that follow an engine seizure. In this action, Flight Lieutenant Sumit Mukherjee displayed courage, presence of mind, and professional skill of very high order. Shall you to you, sir, for yes, this sir. valor. Thank you. Thank so, you. so, our uh, Bayer Veterans Association again salutes you for all this bravery and valor and the true airmanship quality, sir. Thank you. Thank you very sir. much. Yes, sir. You may remember, ADH Stores, Darshan Singh Brar, again, he was the first one, I think, 
he did the dead stick landing at uh, Adampur or Patan Kot somewhere. On a... MiG-21. On a MiG-21, sir? Yeah. This is uh, Ben Brar, sir? No. Darshan Singh Brar. 8-0-5-1 scores. After wait, wait, wait. war, when I met him, he told me, this is DK. I did it, but don't ask me how I did it. But I'll never again not tell that. <laughs> I know. I know. It's 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 horrible. It's horrible. A MiG-21 is so much worse than what I faced. MiG-21 would have been horrible, absolutely. So, which is the most challenging aircraft to fly in the MiG variant, sir? Challenging? Well, uh, I uh, we grew up on the MiG-21. Actually, you know, when you grow up with an aircraft, it's like your the mother's womb. You're most <laughs> yes, comfortable. Sir. Yes, you're sir. Most yeah. co- comfortable in that uh, environment. And I think right from some of the chiefs today, like Air Chief Marshal Tipness used to fly regularly as a chief so- solo in the, in the aircraft. And right till the time we retired, uh, my last sortie on the uh, in the Air Force was on a MiG-21. I said I started life oh. with the MiG-21. <laughs> I will end. <laughs> end <with the> MiG-21. <laughs> okay. So you were so comfortable in the cockpit, and I'm sure today, uh, although the cockpit has changed, in the old MiG-21, if you if you put some of us who have spent a lot of time on that aeroplane, you know where the switches are. You still remember the procedure, and you have an idea and you know, that sort of thing. It's it's very close. And I think I mentioned it last time when uh, all these Russian aircraft have a certain similarity, a very close similarity of the instrument panel, the cockpit, the stick, the vision. Everything is very similar. And uh, so when you transition from MiG-21 to MiG-23, 25, 27, 29, it's easy to sort of relate to the cockpit, to relate to the... Uh, to the environment and feel comfortable. Okay. And um, Shekhar sir, lovely to see you. Hi, thank you. Lovely to have you. Welcome sir. And welcome. Welcome sir. Thank you. And, and uh, so for us, going from aircraft to aircraft is not a problem. The problem is the flying characteristics, which I think uh, people who have flown other types of aeroplanes, whether it be a fighter or whether it be an airliner, like Captain Shekhar has became Captain Shekhar as an airline pilot and captain. So, but there's a natural flair that one develops. Like it's like driving or riding a okay. bicycle. <laughs> okay. You can go from one to the other model and it's not a problem. Okay. Difficult is MiG-23 and MiG-27. Okay. Because the, the tail is about eight inches off the ground in its normal position. Mm. So when you land, the chances of touching your tail are very bright. Okay. You have to you have to be very careful. The undercarriage design was a very peculiar design and it was very uh, it, was a, it was a fantastic design in the sense that a college student designed it incidentally in Russia Achha. and he, okay. he was given a, a very big award for that Oh, great! Uh, and uh, college engineering student so because of the design of the wheels uh, position of the wheels and the wings the 23-27 was a little difficult on the ground to uh, be, one has to be very careful generally they were all very comfortable to fly. The MiG-29 was the easiest. And in fact, when we had a crash and the uh, chief called me to his office and he asked me, he says, uh, supposing I send uh, flight cadets to MiG-29 directly mm-hmm. instead of going to Hunters and uh, to MiG-21 first and then coming. It's supposing I send them to a very high performance aircraft like a MiG-29. So I told him, I said, so frankly speaking, it is the easiest aircraft to take off and land. Okay. I've never flown an easy oh, aircraft in my world. Okay. In my life. It is so powerful. That was the other issue. If, you, then if you're not with the power, then it takes you for a ride, as you say. <laughs> It'll take you for a ride. Okay. So, easiest aircraft to fly, difficult aircraft to fly, difficult MiG-23-27 in the landing oh. phase. Okay. Near the ground. But when it's flying low level, sure, rock steady as a, as a fighter bomber. Fantastic. Mm. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Very good. Right. So, yeah. And which is the most memorable sortie in Indian Air Force for you, sir? Out of your service, memorable sortie or mission? I, I really can't say uh, most memorable or not. There are so many. Something you, special. You heard, you, that time you felt you, something special. You heard the solar eclipse. That one. Yeah. That yeah, was different, yeah, yeah. That was different to what, what others have done. I've had, on the MiG-29, I had the opportunity to fly 
three chiefs of air staff of, of different air forces. Okay. 